advancing the treatment of uncontrolled hypertension with ultrasound-based renal denervation sponsored by Recor. Together with me here are Andrew Sharp from the UK, Mel Lobo from the UK, Joachim Weil from Germany, and we have AJ Kirtany connected um, online out of Colombia in New York, United States, and Sabine Gensotz will serve as the chat master here um, online. So this session actually will deal about uh, the latest clinical evidence around uh, catheter-based ultrasound renal denervation. We will appreciate the differences and distinct features of this approach as compared to others. We will understand perspectives on patient selection and patient preference, and um, we will learn how to introduce renal denervation in the armamentarium of effective and safe blood pressure lowering approaches as of today. Um, I'll hand over to Andrew, yeah. and then we'll kick that session off. Sure. Uh, thanks, Felix. So uh, those of you who've got your app, if you go to room 241, it allows you to put your question in, and I'll see them up here, and then I can put them to our expert panel, our Anglo-German alliance, uh, and um, we, we can <laughs> respond to that throughout. You, there may be some polling questions, I don't know, but um, we, we can talk to you throughout, or you can just go up to the microphone and ask a question. Just announce who you are, <laughs> and then ask your question as nicely as you can. Um, so I think our first speaker is going to be Ajay. Welcome to everybody, and sorry I can't be there in person. Um, as I've said in the morning session, uh, COVID still has some tricks for us. So uh, it, it's just great to be here. And uh, based upon what I see, it sounds like EuroPCR is a smashing success after a few years not having it in person. So I'm jealous um, and uh, sorry that I can't participate in person, but happy to do it in this way, um, if that's helpful. Um, it is World Hypertension today, uh, Day today, and so for this session, um, I was tasked with speaking on safety and efficacy of ultrasound denervation with insights into the clinical trial program, and uh, we really look forward to this session because we spent a fair amount of time crafting it. Um, my disclosures are basically um, from a variety of device companies for research funding to Columbia University and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. And what I'll start by talking about, and just to introduce this, is this is an ultrasound-based technology aimed at effective uh, renal denervation. The idea here is to take a over-the-wire system with a balloon catheter, advance it into the main renal arteries, and inflate the balloon to achieve apposition. Then at that point, uh, the denervation is activated, and you have a seven-second ablation time that heats up the tissue surrounding the artery, which is where the renal nerves travel. There's a cooling balloon to protect the lumen as well, and overall, two to three sonications lasting seven seconds each are applied to the main renal arteries and accessories if they're large enough to accommodate the device. That's how the technology works, and Felix and others are going to talk a little bit more in detail about specifics of the procedure, but what I'll talk about are overall um, the trial designs that have been uh, done and the data that supports the use of this technology at present. What we've basically had um, to date is some completed studies, also studies that are ongoing, and the middle is what we'll focus on, which are sham controlled studies assessing denervation versus the sham procedure. Um, several have been completed, several are actually finished with enrollment, or one has finished enrollment, Radiance 2. I'll touch on that briefly, and then Radiance HTN Duo will be done in Japan. In addition to this, there are um, single arm studies that are being um, conducted that are actually now up and running, and we'll touch briefly upon that perhaps during the discussion section. So the focus of Radiance HTN trial was really the solo and trio cohorts, and we've published these in the Lancet and presented them um, separately. Essentially, I'll present them together here because they had parallel designs. The idea was to take patients who were hypertensive, different populations in fact, those in solo had hypertension despite being on zero to two medicines. In trio, these were patients who were on three or more antihypertensive medicines, so they're poor resistant, and then standardizing their medical regimen. Once that medical regimen was standardized for a four week period, they were then assessed for eligibility for denervation anatomically, then went to the cath lab, and if that criteria were met, they could then be randomized to denervation versus sham. The two populations, though, were a little bit different because solo, these were folks who could come off their medicine safely and then illustrated to have elevated blood pressures before randomization. In the TRIO cohort, these patients had to be on three or more medications. We then standardized them by putting them on a single combination therapy and then ultimately assessing eligibility for randomization. 
Besides those differences, though, the study designs were virtually identical in the sense that the primary endpoint was ascertained at two months in both studies, with daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure as the endpoint. And in addition, there were no medication changes permitted once patients were on that standardized regimen. In addition to that, the patients and the outpatient assessing physicians were blinded to the randomized treatment assignment. So even if medicines needed to be adjusted, this was done without knowing what the initial treatment assignment was. Patients were then followed at two, three, four, five, and then ultimately six months where we assessed <laughs> what their medication burden would be. During that time period, if patients had elevated blood pressures, they were actually encouraged to be started back on medications in order to achieve better levels of control. But because the sham design and the, and the randomization was blinded, patients and their physicians did not know what therapy that they had actually originally gotten. And so therefore we can assess differences in medication burden and blood pressure at the six month time interval. And that's what I'll show you. So Radiance HTN Solo, the primary endpoint was clearly met with a reduction that was greater than sham. Overall, it was 8.5 millimeters of mercury. And this was statistically significant. So the study met its primary endpoint. But beyond the two month time period, the idea was is to add back medications as one would expect with a step care hypertensive uh, regimen. And this started off with amlodipine, then went to uh, standard therapies beyond that time point, and then we assessed what their blood pressure and medication burden was at six months. And what we showed is that at six months, there were less medications added back to the denervation group compared to the sham group. And this was largely because the blood pressures were better in the denervation group compared to the sham group. This is very nicely illustrated in this slide, which looks at the ABPM curves at six months. And so if you're not used to seeing this, this can be somewhat um, difficult to interpret, but I'll try to simplify it. The idea here is in gray is where patients started off with both denervation and sham. Started off similarly, blood pressures were 150 and above. The first set of, of randomization then brought us down in the denervation group to the blue. So a greater reduction in blood pressure compared to sham where there was very little effect, if at all. And then further with the addition of medications, this blood pressure dropped further in the denervation group, but in the sham group, the majority of effect was seen between two and six months, which is when more medications were added back. I think the learning from this is that both denervation and medications can lower blood pressure. It's just that the sham group was not exposed to the denervation, so they had to rely entirely upon medications to lower blood pressure, which is why more medications were added back to that group. In the denervation group, it was the effect of both the denervation plus the medications that was seen. Similarly, in the Radiance HTN TRIO cohort, these were patients who were already on three or more medications and then standardized on that single combination pill. We saw a very similar decrease in blood pressure with denervation relative to sham. And some of this drop in the sham group is due to rescue of patients who had elevated blood pressures and therefore needed medications added back. But because it's intent to treat, we actually don't incorporate that uh, in a separate analysis. We sort of include this in the primary endpoint ascertainment. When we look at six months, just as we saw, saw in the solo, tree, uh, solo cohort, we basically see more medications being added back in the sham group. This was predominantly the use of aldosterone antagonists, which occurred more frequently in that group compared to the denervation group. And overall, the medication burden or the change in medications was greater with sham compared to the denervation group. Similar to how we showed with the ABPM curves in the solo cohort, you see the same effect. At baseline, blood pressures are very elevated. With denervation, it drops at two months. With sham, it does not drop that much. And with sham, with more medications added back, it drops further and does not quite achieve the level of, of drop that was achieved with denervation and some medications added back. We've actually um, assessed these data uh, even even more detail and shown here in the bottom is the increase or difference in aldosterone antagonist usage. And despite more aldosterone antagonist usage in the sham group, one can appreciate that the home blood pressure is actually still greater at all time points than it is for renal denervation. So despite these medicines being added back, some medicines that we can talk about during the discussion period that patients don't tolerate all that well, you still can't quite get the effect that you have with denervation plus some medications added back. We've actually pulled these data together and I actually this morning presented these data um, showing that when you combine the solo and trio cohorts, first of all, there's no heterogeneity in treatment effect. The effects are very similar. Second, the amount of medications that needed to be added back to the denervation group was less compared to that of sham. 
And finally, when you look at the blood pressure measurements, both, both by ambulatory blood pressure as well as home blood pressure, at all time points, blood pressure is lower with denervation compared to sham, especially when you account for these differences in medications. In other words, the primary data from these analyses shows that out through six months, there is a greater drop in blood pressure with denervation compared to sham. These results are largely consistent across pre-specified subgroups. There's perhaps an even greater difference with uh, patients that have uh, waist circumferences greater than 102 centimeters, but overall the effects are preserved across geographies, across starting blood pressures as well. And then finally, and very importantly, safety was no different between these two um, study treatment arms. This is, reflects over 280 patients that were randomized to denervation versus sham, and overall there were no differences between the two groups. It is notable, though, that hypertensive crisis resulting in hospitalization occurred in three patients in the sham group, no patients in the denervation group. Clearly, this is underpowered, though, and needs further study. As far as durability, because this data that I've showed you is out to six months, it's important to determine if these effects can be durable over time. And fortunately, we do have some data showing that from the solo cohort, at least, these effects are durable over time. And this manuscript is currently under review. We additionally have other studies that are um, li largely single arm studies that have been done. Um, the Achieve Registry, as well as experience from Leipzig, Leipzig demonstrating decreases in blood pressure that are sustained over time and quite significant decreases if one looks at where patients started off in terms of their elevations of blood pressure. In summary, these data show that across a range of patient populations, those patients who are on even zero medications, one, two, three, four, and even five or more, we now have data with this device showing significant drops in blood pressure that largely would be clinically significant if we were to sort of have these sustained over the period of time. This is a slide that illustrates that. Um, if you look at the office systolic blood pressure reductions in the denervation arm of multiple studies here, we clearly see that these drops are relevant. They actually will be likely relevant for patients in terms of reduction in events. And I think some of the other analyses that we saw this morning in the late-breaking trial session, um, such as time in the therapeutic range and that sort of thing that we can achieve with denervation, will likely also translate into further reductions in terms of adverse cardiovascular events. So in summary, where are we now with this global clinical study program? I think first, we know that there were failures and successes of endovascular renal, renal denervation. These failures, though, helped us get better. They helped us do sham controlled studies. They helped us redefine the procedure and opt optimize these trial designs, also the procedural uh, characteristics, so as to show in randomized trials that we could reduce blood pressure safely. We've demonstrated that both in the presence and absence of medications, that renal denervation can lower blood pressure, and in addition, can reduce medication burden or the need to have medications added back um, in addition to demonstrating durability and safety. And the results of more of these trials, such as Radiance 2, which is now completed enrollment, which we hope to present um, in the fall of this year, as well as other continued studies, are going to be reported in the near future. Hopefully in the United States, that means a device approval in the not too distant future, but then also further advancing the science and the field as a whole. So with that, I'll stop and I think we can take some time for questions and also show potentially other, other study designs that are upcoming. Absolutely. Thank you so much, AJ. I'll first ask the audience if there are some questions in the room. Anything you want to ask AJ or I know one of the faculty members? I know what they want to ask. AJ, if, if drugs provide catch-up blood pressure control, why have renal denervation? Well, I think the issue really relates to, you know, tolerability, number one, and what all studies that we've looked at with a medication adherence over time, and, and I, Michelle Azizi spoke about this very nicely um, in the morning session, um, show that there is a waning of, of adherence to them. So I think in an ideal world, for patients who are able to tolerate drugs, that's a great solution for them. And certainly lifestyle modification is very important as well. But we do know that despite the broad availability of medications, we know that 40% of patients worldwide still remain very uncontrolled, and that leads to significant cardiovascular morbidity. So my sense is, is that any additional tool that can be demonstrated to be complementary to the things that we already had, it would be one thing if it was one or the other, but this is not that. This is something that's complementary and additive, and if you have that in addition, 
then it will likely allow patients to achieve a sort of ceiling of blood pressure. And then further additions can be, can be made in the, in the cases that they need to with the addition of medications. Mm -hmm. Mel, you had a question? So, uh, Ajay, my uh, question may help um, clarify the response to Andrew Sharp. Payers and healthcare commissioners are interested in paying for therapies that get patients to target. In the uh, follow-up period of the study following the primary endpoint, clinicians in the research centres were mandated to treat blood pressure to target to achieve hypertension control with a medication add-on regimen. What happened? Well, it's a good thing. I mean, I, I, we, there, actually, many of the investigators are sort of sitting on the panel as well. And I think that it was there was better achievement of target than we would have otherwise seen. But it clearly shows you we need to do better. And as I presented the original data of TRIO, I made this point in the sense that the rates of overall control, even in the confines of this trial where people are coming back and being seen on a monthly basis, still pale in comparison to what we would want. Now, these patients in TRIO were certainly uh, more resistant to start off with. They had elevated blood pressures despite being on like four medications. Um, but it's difficult to get people to control. What is interesting, and I think this is the, the key thing that we've learned from doing these studies, is that there are two different things that can affect blood pressure. There's the denervation and there's the medications. And ultimately, the blood pressure is after that. So what you see in very interesting trials, if the med regimen remains the same, then you see a greater reduction in blood pressure during the follow-up period. On the other hand, if the medication regimen is differentially favoring the sham arm, then the blood pressure reduction does not appear to be as great. And the reason for that is because we know medicines work. So I think it's really a multi-pronged approach, and this is not something where one size fits all. For individual patients, they're going to need multiple hits on the target in order to achieve control. AJ, you also mentioned that there was an uptitration protocol used in the clinical trials. Can you elucidate a little bit more on that? And also from a clinical perspective, are there specific drug classes that you would prefer post-renal denovation or that you would avoid post-renal denovation and stop in patients not treated within these sham controlled studies, but probably in real-world conditions within registries, for instance? It's a great question. I, I think that some of that needs to be elucidated. Um, one could theoretically make the argument that maybe there should be less beta blocker use, but frankly, beta blockers are not first line anyway for the treatment of hypertension. For these protocols, um, these they really were sort of standardized care. So for the patients that were in, for instance, the solo cohort, they started off with a calcium channel blocker, then added a thiazide, then added an ARB, what you'd expect. For the trio cohort, because they were already on that combination therapy, the next medication added was an aldosterone antagonist. I think many people would argue, and I, I certainly, I thought Andrew's first question was going to be, why not just treat everybody with, with spironolactone? Because it seems to work pretty well. Um, and that's true. It does work pretty well. Unfortunately, at a year or beyond, not many patients remain on it. Um, and a plerinone is not really the best substitute because the doses that are traditionally used are not the doses for heart failure are not the doses that you need for hypertension. So I do think that um, we need to sort out in the future what the idealized regimens might be in conjunction with renal denervation. Those are an interesting series of studies that we can think about, but it's not known at present as far as I know. Joachim? RJ, a more pragmatic question and not so much a scientific question. So uh, in many procedures, we do have responders and non-responders. Can you tell us how many non-responders we have in this study? And what does it mean for the blood pressure reduction in the responder group? Will it be higher in average? So, so that's a great question. And I think that there's two ways of looking at it. The first way is that there's one third of patients who are going to be non-responders. But the second way of looking at it is that exactly what you said, when we present means or median values, it takes into account the non-responders. And so in general, if you have a response, the response is much greater than what I've demonstrated as the aggregate treatment effect. Um, who these non-responders are and how we can isolate them so as to avoid them having to have a procedure obviously is something of very hot interest. Um, there are some, some people who would say that these are patients perhaps elderly patients with more arterial stiffness, they're going to respond less. But all of these predictor papers don't, there's not one thing that sort of comes out in these predictors that then is consistent across all studies. So we need more data in that regard. But yes, it is true that those that do respond tend to have a greater effect. 
So any questions from the audience? You can put it on the app if you want. If you just open your app, go to Interact, select room 241, you can ask a question. Uh, but um, for now, we're going to move on. Thank you, RJ, and uh, you're looking well. Uh, so <laughs> now we're going to move on to uh, Felix Mafoud, uh, who is from Hamburg in Germany. He's sort of the father of the field, really, I think even though he's only a young whippersnapper. So uh, uh, he has led us in all directions in this field and led us to success. So I'm looking forward to hearing about the German experience and uh, perhaps the dark times and then the light. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, it's indeed my privilege now to share with you some experiences that we made in Germany with respect to renal denervation. So first of all, let us talk briefly about what we have learned, right? So um, we touched upon it, and everybody who's talking about renal denervation will certainly come to the point where he or she has to address the ultimate target of renal denervation, which are the sympathetic nerves. And at the very beginning, when we started renal denervation in 2009, actually, we were taught that we should focus on the proximal part where the density of the nerves is super high. So all the tension that we paid was getting a, a superior ablation very proximal at the ostium of the renal sympathetic nerves, at the ostium of the renal arteries where the density of the renal sympathetic nerves is really um, thought to be high. What we learned then post Simplicity HTN3 was that the density and the distribution of the nerves changes throughout the artery, right? It is interestingly high at the superior at the superior and proximal part of the renal arteries and the nerves are getting closer and the distal part of um, the renal arteries particularly prior to the bifurcation but we also learned that when we want to achieve ablation successful denervation of a kidney we need to come up with an approach that provides circumferentiality so we need to treat all four quadrants the superior the inferior, the posterior, and the anterior segment of the renal artery has to be treated to achieve a successful denervation, not only in pigs and in animals, but also in humans. And um, the ultrasound technology that we're discussing in here has unique features, and it is shown here. It creates so-called donuts. I like that ex expression because it, it nicely um, illustrates and describes the... Um, the features of this catheter in terms of ablation pattern, as you can see here. So um, it comes, it, it's an over-the-wire catheter that's introduced to se through a, a seven French guiding catheter. And then we start ultrasound emissions. And these ultrasound emission, and that's an, a distinct feature of ultrasound too, you can modify the penetration depth um, very accurately. And with this catheter here, according to the vessel diameter, we penetrate from one to six millimeters. We sparse the endothelium. I'll show you that in a second. So there's cooled fluid circulating throughout the ultrasound emission to protect the endothelium to make certain that we're not damaging the endothelial cells provided there. We've also learned from animal experience that when you do multiple ablations, two or three, you kind of get a saturation in the effect. One is not sufficient to get all nerves hit. But if you do two or three per renal artery, you hit almost 98% of all nerves located in there. So again, this catheter is designed for patient safety. Um, the endothelium is cooled, whereas the outer perivascular space is heated up with this catheter to provide uh, renal denervation. I included the video because it, it nicely shows how the catheter is indeed working. Seven seconds of ultrasound sonication. You can see the first donut here, the second one being created here. So thermal gel is, is used to visualize the effect of this catheter now. It turns opaque when it's heated up and we change the angulation now, and the coaxial view. You can nicely see that this is truly a circumferential ablation and, and we are targeting all segments of the renal artery and again the endothelium is um, protected by cooled water that is circulating through the balloon. This is um, actually a pre-procedural imaging showing that we try to target at least three ablations, three sonications per renal artery and we're also treating 
a polar arteries and accessory arteries if they are eligible for treatment. So then the question comes up, of course, whom should we treat with renal denervation and what are features of patients that may benefit from renal denervation therapy? And I'm sure Joachim Weil and Mel Lobo will discuss that further, but I will provide you some experiences that we made in Germany and how we select patients for renal denervation. I think one feature of all patients that are eligible for denervation is um, the fact that they are difficult to control, right? We, we challenge, it, it's challenging for us, we face challenges in get patient, patients to blood pressure targets. We should confirm primary hypertension, of course. It's not the treatment modality for secondary causes of hypertension, unless obstructive sleep apnea, I would say. But in all other cases, treat the underlying disease of secondary hypertension first, and then consider renal denervation, if at all. Patient preference, the big winner besides non-adherence in um, hypertension management is patient preference. For the first time, I hear physicians talking about patient preference in hypertension management. And this is also related to the fact that we now have devices available to treat hypertension. And this is certainly something that is put on center stage. We'll discuss more and more about patient preference, how to integrate patients' choice and their experience with treatments and their wish to come up with a treatment modality. May it be lifestyle modification, may it be drugs, or may it be renal denervation. Elevated cardiovascular risk. This is for me as a cardiologist particularly interesting. When I see patients, even with mild elevations in blood pressure, but at high cardiovascular risk, I think that is an, an excellent patient population for a device-based approach, because in, particularly in these patients, every millimeter drop in blood pressure improves into, uh, translates into improved outcomes. Rule out white coat hypertension. There's absolutely no reason to treat a patient with a white coat hypertension. So any patient that is considered for a device-based approach should at least have out-of-office blood pressure readings being performed, may it be home or ambulatory blood pressure. This is a slide from Roland Schmieder, a paper from Roland Schmieder published in Journal of Hypertension. And you can see that even nephrologists start now talking about patient preference in hypertension care. And you can see here that, you know, in this shared decision making, it's both. It's the patient preference, but also the physician recommendation coming to a decision that is shared by both the patient and the physician. And of course, various factors may contribute to patient preference, such as side effects on antihypertensive agents, such as the risk associated with elevation in blood pressure, right? We fear patients sometimes in telling them, you know what, your risk of, of getting a stroke is super high, so we need to get your blood pressure control. And personal experience, including comorbidities, may drive patient preference. And on the right-hand side, you can see physicians' recommendations may be driven by the blood pressure range, but may also be driven by the number of medications. For me, cardiovascular risk always is important, and certainly comorbidities, including chronic kidney disease, atrial fibrillation, for instance, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Roland Schmieder did a survey in Germany where he asked hypertensive individuals on their preference to be treated with a device-based approach versus drug therapy. And in patients not taking antihypertensive uh, medication, you can see that roughly 40% of the patients would be interested in a device-based approach. And in patients prescribed to one or more antihypertensive drugs, 28% of the patients would be interested in a device-based approach. This certainly depends also on the blood pressure range and the number of medication. The more medication you take, the more interested you are in renal denervation, for sure, as shown here. So patients who are considered to be resistant hypertensive individuals on three or more drugs, 50%, every second patient is interested in a device-based approach to lower their blood pressure. What should we do with a patient workup? And we'll hear more about that in uh, the upcoming talks. But I want to focus on two aspects here that I think are important. Again, out of office blood pressure readings, super important to exclude white coat hypertension. We don't know whether white coat hypertension at all associates with increased risk. So there is no reason to treat these patients with either antihypertensive drugs or a device-based approach 
as of today. We should rule out secondary causes of hypertension because in many of these patients you can cure the hypertension by treating the underlying cause. And very popular, very famous now is shared decision making. So ask your patient, ask the patient sitting in front of you what the preference is and make your recommendation according also to the preference of the patient. In Germany, and um, this is something specific now, I guess, to Germany, uh, related to Germany, uh, we came up with all the three societies involved in patient care and hypertension, namely the German Cardiac Society, the German Hypertension League, and the German Society of Nephrology. Uh, we would certify renal denovation centers, centers of excellence. And this is also driven by the requests of insurance companies. They want to provide cost coverage only in centers who are qualified to perform a renal denovation appropriately. And not only the procedure, but also the follow-up and the pre-procedural planning of the patients. So we, we have certain criteria. I listed only eight here on the slide. But if you're interested, there's a paper published um, listing all the criteria that are important for the certification process. It comes with personal uh, and uh, procedural requirements. Uh, we also came up with the number, so we believe that a minimum of 25 renal artery interventions have to be performed in the center. Patient selection and inclusion in a registry is recommended. Um, we should have ambulatory and home blood pressure measurement capabilities available. And we need um, follow-up examinations to be performed, very importantly, at 3, 6, and 12 months after the procedure. And then yearly, the patient should be followed in these centers. And we do need cooperations with other disciplines, intra-hospital cooperation with an intensive care unit, radiology, nephrology, hypertension experts. So various skills have to be involved in the path of a hypertensive patients considered for renal denovation. With that, I thank you very much for listening and look forward to your questions now. Thanks, Felix. Uh, we've got a question online and then we'll uh, move on to the panel on the floor. Um, question from Dr. Aziz. How does ultrasound ablation compare with RF ablation when it comes to blood pressure reduction? There is no head-to-head -head comparison available up to date. No trial um, has investigated um, in a sham-controlled fashion ultrasound renal denovation to RF to sham. There has one study been conducted by Philip Luertz in Leipzig where he showed that there is no significant difference between ultrasound and radiofrequency <coughs> renal denovation performed in the um, post bifurcation arteries and the segmental arteries. So the approach that we're using in the most recent, that we have used in the most recent trials. So up to date, I think there is no clinical evidence indicating that the one is better than the other. You have to choose a modality that you feel comfortable with. I think you can appreciate that the devices are very different from each other. And um, they, of course, with, you know, it's the same with, with any device. They come with certain advantages and the disadvantages. Well, that brings me to the next online question from uh, Dr. Gant Saltz. What is the average procedure time based on your experiences? Uh, is it predictable? Uh, is there certain case anatomies that can extend it? Any yeah. thoughts on that? So it's shorter with ultrasound renal denovation as compared to radiofrequency renal denovation. Also because with our F systems, you have to embark into the segmental arteries. That takes more time. And here you have seven seconds sonication. So three times makes it 20 seconds sonication per renal artery, so 40 in total per case. You know, you have to get to the arteries, you have to prepare everything. So I guess it's it's 30 minutes for this um, technology to get a patient treated. Any questions from the panel? Anything yes, for question. the floor? Yeah, that's a good point. Just repeat that for the online. Yeah, so, so the, question, the is question is, if you have a short bifurcation, what do you do? Um, and how do you treat that patient, right? So if possible at all, you have a very short main and an early bifurcation, I would try to treat both the, the post bifurcation, right? If it's possible, treat the main. If, it, if the landing zone is, is long enough, treat the main. 
and post bifurcation, if the landing zone is too short, get into the superior one and in the, into the inferior branch, but treat both. There's another question online. Um, is there any evidence of benefit of this treatment in subgroups like diabetics or kidney disease? Very good question. We would, of course, um, consider diabetics and CKD patients as patients with not only an elevation in cardiovascular risk, but also with proven um, elevations in sympathetic nervous system activity. Both have shown to have very high sympathetic nervous system activity, so potential candidates for renal denervation. Um, in this study here, you can see, depending on, on where you look, in TRIO there were more patients with diabetes, in the SOLO study there were only few patients with diabetes, but there was no specific subgroup that benefited more or less from this procedure. In registries, in larger data sets, we'll see that diabetics have a higher cardiovascular risk and we would consider these patients to benefit most from blood pressure lowering. Yeah. I guess the other thing, question for me, Felix, is at the moment this is a femoral procedure. So do you see any potential for this becoming a radial procedure, a route that most interventionists are more comfortable with now? Yeah, I think I think it's no secret, right, that that all the companies are working on transradial uh, uh, catheters f to, to to renal denervation. Um, at the moment, I'm you know we're applying for cost coverage with insurance companies, so I'm quite happy that it is an inpatient procedure. So an in-hospital procedure, the patients are not treated on an outpatient basis, um, th th because. Oh, only for regulatory and reimbursement purposes, that's um, a good thing at the moment. But principally speaking, totally with you, this can become an outpatient procedure as soon as we have a transradial version available. Felix, any restriction concerning the renal function? Yeah, also a good question. So in the studies, we excluded patients with an EGFR below 40 in clinical practice. Um, we have done a couple hundred cases, so I, I'm, I'm not withholding this therapy to patients with even severe CKD, but we can do this with very, very few contrast. And I said it earlier, these are not the cases to start with, right? So if you want to set up your program, do it in patients with preserved renal function. Don't start this procedure in patients with severely impaired renal function. You require at the beginning more contrast. It takes more time, and contrast is the worst thing you can I got a patient with CKD. Um. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. So we're we're continuing now. Um, we have Mel Lobo with us, who's an uh, expert and hypertension expert working in the UK, and we will talk about. Um, how one should build up a program on interventional hypertension treatment. Mel, I know you have a very successful one up and running in London. Let us know your thoughts on how to do that. Well, thanks, uh, Felix. Thanks, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, th yeah, there's not very much time here to talk about this, and Felix has covered some of this, but this is probably more a plea for people with um, an interest in developing renal innovation programs to take account of the need to properly screen patients that are hypertensive. And that requires a center that has uh, certain facilities in it, not always uh, readily available. We believe that imaging facilities with cross-sectional modalities are preferable here, particularly if you're staging for renal denervation super, super, uh, suitability with either technology, RF or ultrasound. Um, and duplex ultrasonography for renovascular disease is actually very, very uh, operator dependent and not done well in most places. The specialists um, who undertake the procedure can be interventional radiologists or cardiologists or angiologists as long as they are comfortable not only intervening on the renal artery but also dealing with the consequences of any uh, intervention gone wrong. And then hypertension specialists are actually accredited throughout Europe via the European Society of Hypertension, and they have to demonstrate competency in managing, investigating secondary hypertension, dealing with complex cases. And these uh, groups of different doctors would need to combine uh, in a multidisciplinary environment for, for patient selection and also to plan uh, treatment and appropriate follow-up. And timing of follow-up is interesting because um, Felix gave an example for the German 
uh, setting there, but actually it's not really clear what sort of follow-up we need when we have such a safe procedure. Now, that slide is not designed to be read. It's more just to <laughs> de demonstrate to you that the hypertension specialist is thinking of multiple different drivers of hypertension. And these are some of the reasons why you may not respond to a renal denervation procedure. And therefore, if you don't take these into account in screening the patients, you will miss things. And the ESH and ESC guidelines for hypertension, this is from 2014, but actually the updated guidelines show a very similar plan for screening for secondary hypertension in certain cases. And the idea is that uh, there are certain red flags, young onset hypertension or patients whose blood pressure is not responding to multiple medications, um, patients who uh, seem to have adverse uh, target organ damage, now called hypertension-mediated organ damage. And then based upon those clues, we have a pathway here that takes the patient through um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And as Felix said, don't treat patients with renal denervation who have white coat hypertension because they're not hypertensive. Uh, exclude other factors, and now adherence is uh, coming into the frame, and there are means to screen for this, and then screen for secondary hypertension. And again, not a slide designed to be read, because I have very little time, but the uh, point is to get across how complex screening for mineralocorticoid hypertension can be. And this is not something that you can do as a hobby. You either have training in understanding how to assay renin, aldosterone, the most optimal conditions to do it, under and how to interpret the results, or you don't. And if you don't, then you need people around you who do. And there are many pitfalls in interpreting hyperaldosteronism type data because there are interfering uh, drugs. You have to take things further with adrenal venous sampling. Once you have evidence of hyperaldosteronism, that requires um, proof of lateralization. And technically, that's very, very difficult to do, only done well in some centers. And don't forget that in your screening of your patients for renal denervation suitability, about 10% of adults will have adrenal nodules. Well, what are you going to do about that? So, you know, there is a big onus upon us not to overlook these potential secondary causes of hypertension. Now, I was asked, well, where will we find patients for um, suitability for renal denervation? Well, we've demonstrated that renal denervation works in patients who are medication naive and patients with resistant hypertension and patients taking multiple drugs. And so where are they coming from? Well, in the UK, we believe there are 15 million people of adult age with hypertension. So even if a fraction of a percentage of that group required renal denervation, we would overwhelm the cardiac catheterization laboratory capacity of the UK to treat them with renal denervation across 20 odd centers. And so there are plenty of these patients around. And in some respects, you don't have to worry about you know, finding the patients because the patients present. When we um, advertise for clinical trials of renal denervations, the patients came running to us because they were interested in non-drug approaches to treating their hypertension. And they were interested in durable hypertension control that didn't involve polypharmacy. And so the, there are people around. The figures for the UK are echoed largely around the world. And anyone who's seen the recent data from the blood pressure lowering trialists will, will see that hypertension control rates globally are actually appalling and declining, probably worsened with the pandemic. Please also don't forget that in the case of um, screening patients for hypertension, they're coming to you with significant levels of blood pressure in some cases, and you can get on with a dual program. One limb of the program is to screen them to make sure they don't have a secondary cause of hypertension. The other limb is to get on and de-risk them. And we were talking about cardiovascular risk before. Don't leave your patients at 150, 160 without adjusting medications. And in my personal uh, practice, I believe in a single pill approach to treating hypertension. So one drug in one pill, two drugs in one pill, or a combination formulation with three active drugs. Thank you very much. So we'll discuss both presentations at the end, I guess. Um, Joachim Weil, working in Germany, will provide um, a different perspective, uh, more from an interventional cardiology, I Yeah, guess. thank you, Felix. Um, ladies and gentlemen, to be honest, without Mel sending me patients, I can't build anything. So this highlights also the importance of working together to have cooperations with um, different disciplines. Um, let me just start my 
slides now. So these are my potential conflicts of interest. You know that uh, Hypertension 3 trial has cast doubt on real innovation as a whole, and we have a loss of confidence, or we had a loss of confidence, because now we do have new data, as you learned today, showing that real innovation works. The question is, how do we um, regain trust for our referring physicians? And I think we can do it with trust. What does it mean? We need to be transparent, report current study results. We need to be responsive, so address obstacles to overcome in this technique and use care and optimize our patient selection. And then, since being sincere and state our own results and complications which we have in the real world. And last but not least, by this we are trustworthy and divide our information with the patients and our referring, um, referring physicians. So there is, in my eyes, a stepwise development of a renal innovation program, and that's how we did it in our um, center. The first step is to set up a center plan, and you heard about um, the uh, German initiative uh, led by Felix Mafoud and uh, um, s telling us what we need to have to set up a renal innovation center. And then we need a foundation of a multidisciplinary team. And uh, this is, in my eyes, very important. It's not the hypertension specialist alone, but it's also the interventionalist and maybe other subgroups and disciplines. And then we have to identify a referring physician. And last but not least, we need to do education internally in the hospital, but also externally for um, our referring physicians. And there are different stages of the referrer's journey, which I try to put together in this slide. And make a long story short, we have awareness, consideration, initial re um, referrals, and regular referring. And you see the desired response here, and you can read by your own. But what I want to see, the key success factors for this transition is referring physician willingness to build a practice, careful selecting patients, which probably will respond to this um, procedure, maximize positive patient experience when he is in the hospital, and communicate very closely to your referring physician because it's a new technique. And I made up a checklist for the interventionalist here. So for sure, you have to look for the written consent, check the laboratory test, look for co contrast allergy, but you also have to update your procedure checklist because the, um, the wires may be different, the guiding catheters are different, they are shorter, they're only 55 centimeters. You should look for contraindication. Every patient needs an ACT uh, above 250 seconds. Um, by using heparin. We usually give nitro, 100 micrograms into the renal artery to have maximal diameter of the artery. Don't forget, and uh, in the uh, reaction of renal arteries are a little slower than in the coronary, so you have to wait a little bit. We need conscious sedation in these patients because it's a painful procedure. And you have to have atropine in your hand if you get a bradycardic um, phase after renal denervation. Every patient, at least in our hospital, gets aspirin or a similar drug um, for at least four weeks after the procedure. So, and this is our timeline in the Lübeck protocol, as I tell you. So, in the beginning, we, we look for patients, we have a selection, and then we start the workup. And you learned about the workup by, by Mel, and then it comes to the renal uh, denervation procedure, but it doesn't stop at this point. So, it's going on afterwards. We do need really to, to have our follow ups, and usually we have a follow up after one months, then three months, six months, and a year. And thereby, uh, it's very helpful to have a registry um, for these patients. And uh, to summarize my talk, I think uh, as in whole medicine, we need to keep the patient at the center of care. We need to create awareness through our local hospital. Um, 
about this method, which is probably new in many hospitals, and uh, continue with our communication with the referring physician. We need to discuss learnings from all the trials we have seen in the past, and we need to share personal experience, and I think this is very, very important, personal experience with you referring um, physicians and the patients for sure. And then, as I said, update your procedural checklist. And last but not least, you need to be able to treat emergencies in and unexpected um, circumstances in the cath lab if anything happens. Also, we learned this is a very sure, uh, very safe um, procedure. And by that, saying by that, I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Joachim, can we just tap you up as our interventionist of choice? We've got a couple of questions that have sort of bridged the last talk and this one. Um, first is, how do you select the right balloon size for your recall renal denervation procedure? Well, in the study, we had a CT scan before, so it was very, uh, relatively easy. But uh, this, I think, is not, cannot be done in a routine base. But we have the angiogram, and we can do um, measurements of the angiogram and uh, this works very well, well. Okay, next question is, uh, how often do you need to change the catheter size? So is it one balloon for all, or do you have to use multiple balloons? Oh, it depends. So I think about 20% of our patients have accessory renal arteries, and we want to treat them as well. So in these patients, you need a second balloon for sure, because the accessory renal arteries are smaller. And uh, I would say about 25 30%, maybe you need a second balloon. Okay, and we've got an online question that will go straight to Mel's heart. It'll warm your heart, Mel. Um, how do we measure sympathetic activity and should we? Oh. Uh -huh. oh, if anyone had the answer to that question, they'd be very, very wealthy <laughs> and they wouldn't need to worry about renal denervation. Um, so at the moment, the techniques that um, measure sympathetic activity that are direct would be microneurogra microneurography or norepinephrine spillover and those are both highly um, skilled proce procedures investigational procedures that are not done very well and only done really in a handful of centers worldwide to a you know reproducible standard which means that they're not scalable so right now we use proxies for sympathetic nervous system activation and a reasonable or emergent proxies appear to be things like high resting heart rate elevated diastolic blood pressure with narrow pulse pressure pointing away from arterial stiffness, orthostatic hypertension, maybe. And in, perhaps in the future, we know that a significant proportion of patients who have white coat hypertension go on to develop uh, systemic arterial hypertension. So maybe that, that could be a group for the future. And so perhaps we can come back to building a service. So Felix, um do you want to lead off on, on asking the chaps about how they've really put everything together? I mean, we've had the slides, but I'm sure we could hear a little bit more about that. So uh, where are the patients coming from in your both services? Are these self-referring, self-referred? So do you see the patients um, in your hospital, in your department, and you consider them as coronary artery disease patients with a high blood pressure on multiple medications, or are these patients referred by nephrologists, hypertension experts, internists? So very recently, we now see up, uh, we do see referring from nephrologists to our hospital again. But uh, this hasn't which been... Good, which is a good sign. Yeah, which is a good sign. But this is only since maybe half a year. It wasn't before, and uh, in the time before, we usually were doing all the studies, and um, we had a lot of self-referring patients. And I think this is something we will see in the future as well. And you showed this data showing that there, uh, there's a proportion of patients who like rather an intervention instead of taking lifelong polypharmacy. Andrew, you're an interventional cardiologist too, so where are you getting your patients from? Well, I also run a hypertension clinic, so I noticed Kostas is in the audience as well, who's a world-renowned hypertension specialist and an interventional cardiologist. So uh, there's, a, there's, there's a few of us who do both sides of the fence, but I think it's important that that's not how services proceed. I think we need a multidisciplinary team like we do for coronary artery revascularization. I think we've got the heart team. I think we need the hypertension team. So my referrals come from clinical pharmacologists, nephrologists, GPs, uh, cardiology colleagues, and uh, they all go into clinical trials at the moment. Uh, Joachim mentioned 
um, procedural complications, and and he also mentioned that the procedure is very safe, as AJ did in his presentation. You know, but if you want to set up a program, a real innovation program, what do you think should be on the shelf um, when you embark for the first time with a real innovation catheter? Coverage. I'll just drop some words here: covered stents, coils. Um, which rescue therapy would you propose, if any? Uh, I think I wouldn't. Um, you need a hospital that's capable of doing those things, but the frequency of events, like you're describing perforation, even even renal artery dissection, is incredibly low. So Ray Townsend led the publication, I think we were both on it, um, that um, showed over 7,000 cases. The, the complication rate was extremely low and mostly related to guiding catheters interacting with osteal uh, renal artery disease. So um, uh, my personal view is that the hospital should have the ability to cope with any complication, but it's not like we need to go in all suited up. You know, I think this is a very safe procedure. But as with all things that we do, we need to have the ability on site to deal with anything unexpected. We're talking about frequencies here of one in a thousand. Yeah. I mean, groin complications are the biggest thing. Right. Uh, a lot of people have forgotten how to handle groins on the wards. I mean, it's come back a little with Tavi, but... Um, uh, you, you know, the operator will need to reskill the nurses looking after the patients afterwards if they're not familiar with femoral arterial procedures anymore, which you'd be surprised that Good point. these centers yeah. do exist. Yeah, Very I totally common. agree. I, I think the complication does not come from the ablation catheter, but rather from the guiding catheter. This is something you really should take care, of, and therefore I think you need to have at least renal stents in the shelf, or you need to have a friend in radiology who has the stents, which you can call, because otherwise uh, the stents will never be taken out of the shelf in your lab. But um, So I think that's the main reason. And the other complication is probably from the puncture side. Yeah. And I mean, we have done 300 cases maybe, and we had one um, complication, and this was from the puncture side. Yeah, I think that... Sorry, AJ, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I think that in interventional cardiology, there are definitely, um, you know, procedures where you're concerned about your patients, but you do them and you very quickly understand that I really need to have my senses about me during this procedure and other ones where you sort of immediately understand that the likelihood of something going wrong is going to be mainly because of something really bad that I did. And this falls into the latter category, not the former. This is not one where you sort of have this heightened anxiety going into the case. Um, in many cases, it's, it's a pretty comfortable procedure and it's really just really focusing on the access and the engagement of the corner and the engagement of the renals, I mean. Can you say something about the learning curve, AJ? The learning curve of this procedure? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty short. Um, I think it's device specific to some extent as well. But um, in this scenario, you want people who have endovascular skills. So they're working, they're, they know how to work with the aorta and they know how to engage. But my sense is, is that if you have a guide catheter that can engage with a simple 014 wire system, um, this is not a complex procedure. It's really the, the, the biggest thing would be if you're impatient for the balloon to come down and then you try to do something too quickly. It's one of those types of situations. So I, I think that the learning curve is, is not steep at all for this one. Okay, maybe I can add. So for, to my experience, it's not so much the procedure, it's rather the strategy where people get confused. So should, as we heard from the colleague from the audience here, should we do the short main stem? How can we go? How far should we go? How close should be the next ablation? So rather strategy questions than uh, the procedure per se. And this comes with experience, so. Sure. If I could just uh, ask RJ to answer a question online. It's a question really about redo procedures. You briefly mentioned in your talk about the durability of this procedure. Do you believe that there'll be a need for redo how often have we seen it within the Radiance program? So we, we haven't actually seen it within the Radiance program, and I'll probably defer to Felix and other folks that have more clinical use of this. I hope not. I hope that there's not something that needs a redo to be done. Certainly people have proposed, well, maybe you need to have it every five years or something. But if you're the patient, that might be okay, but it'd be better to not have to have that happen. So the question is, is can we get an effective enough ablation so that it's durable without having to do that? Um, Felix, you, you want to talk a little bit about your experience with either prior failures or other devices, cross devices, or redo? 
There's one publication out of Hamburg, which is called the Alster Registry, where they did 10 cases, redo 10 cases, um, where they started with an RF device and then used ultrasound and showed that in six out of the 10 patients, there was an additional decline in blood pressure observed. It's purely research. Um, it's nothing we should do in clinical practice as of today. If you want to do it, these patients should be um, treated within a clinical study, I think. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our time. So I'll just summarize the session. Uh, so we heard from RJ about the data that have been uh, published in The Lancet in 2018, uh, which was Radiant Solo, showing that off drugs, the addition of the recall uh, ultrasound device reduced blood pressure from a single procedure lasting 30, 40 minutes. Then in the Radiance Trio publication from last year, uh, patients on a triple pill, so resistant hypertension patients, um, who had uh, a recall uh, Radiance procedure added on top and that further reduced blood pressure. And then when we put the data together and add drugs to these patients, we see that uh, drugs on top of denovation do lower blood pressure and denovation on top of drugs lowers blood pressure. So it appears that we can see a signal for maintenance of denovation benefit with or without drugs on patients on zero drugs, on three drugs, or who are having drug titrations uh, somewhere in between. So I, I think we're getting close to answering most of the questions in this field. We've got a safe and effective procedure. It's not a cure, it's just part of the package. It should be treated as part of the package. So on that note, um, I'm gonna sign off and thanks for coming, staying so late. Thanks very much. <laughs>